Throughout all of 2020 and the start of 2021, through all the nastiness and unrequested private time, I think the topic I found myself thinking about the most is, what would I do if everything went back to normal? If there was a big reset button tomorrow and everything reopened and I could do whatever I wanted, what would I do that's different from what I was already forced to do during the lockdown. This is something that I imagine a lot of you at home have thought about yourselves, and I presume that the first thing most of you have thought about is that dream vacation that you just kept putting off. You know, Disneyland, Italy, London, Paris. And those are all reasonable answers to come up with. There's a sense of adventure, excitement, romance even. And if there's any place in the world that brings to mind all of those emotions, it's a kind of weird looking McDonald's sitting in the middle of nowhere. Let me set up a basic piece of context before I explain this. The final thing I did before the pandemic started was film a video called My Garfield Vacation. For those of you who haven't seen that video, it's basically an investigation into the obscure Garfield vacation culture of southern Indiana, as well as a miniature documentary into my process in archiving long-forgotten Garfield Lost Media. That entire process took me about six days, and those six days were some of the happiest days that I've had in the last six years. And you know, I've been feeling a lot better recently. I've been having a much better time in the last few months, but still six days in a row where I felt amazing 24 hours a day. That's something that I sometimes struggle to accomplish. And so when it happens, I want to capture it and I want to understand why I felt good and I, I want to do something like that again. And so throughout this entire international pandemic, I've basically been constantly trying to think of an appropriate quasi-sequel to the Garfield Vacation video. You know, something that would allow me to explore cultural gems hidden in the middle of Midwestern America. And that thought process eventually reminded me of a story from when I was a kid. You see, when I was a really young kid, I used to take these long road trips to visit my papa, who lived in North Carolina. Papa would take us out to do things that he enjoyed and he wanted to pass on to us, like fishing or golf, things that I thought were really boring, which is something that I had a hard time hiding. The point is that one day he took us out to do something weird that I can't remember, and we stopped at a McDonald's, and it was log cabin themed. From the outside, it looked like a log cabin, but with a big M on the front. And from the inside, it was like a huge hunter's lodge. They had deer heads and little wooden supports and decorations. And it was one of the coolest things I had ever seen. I was at that age where I really loved stories about the pioneers, about Daniel Boone and Boonesboro, so this was just something that blew my mind, and I told everyone about it. For all the zoos and museums that Papa took me to see, the main thing that stuck with me through those vacations was how amazing it was that Log Cabin McDonald's was out there. And one day, I could go back. And as I thought about this, I eventually realized that a road trip video exploring themed McDonald's in odd places would be a really fun post-pandemic project. So I mentioned on Twitter that I really wanted to do this video, but that it was probably too expensive to be realistic, and something really strange ended up happening. That being, a McDonald's representative reached out to me and offered to send me gifts as an encouragement to do that video. And so I got these gifts back in January, and it was a lot of really nice stuff, including a camera and magnets and a personal letter wishing me luck on the project. And this got me, like, honestly, really excited to work on this. But the only problem is, as I just mentioned, if I made that video, it would easily be the most expensive thing I've ever worked on. And so I thought, how could I possibly afford this? And I eventually realized that I could make it a stretch goal on my Patreon. 
And so if you go to my Patreon right now, you'll find out that is one of our stretch goals. And if you pledge a dollar or two, you're going to get us one step closer to eventually making the McDonald's road trip video. Now, I know what you're thinking. Quentin, isn't this the McDonald's video? Like, if this isn't the McDonald's video, then what the hell am I watching? An ad for your Patreon? Well, look, I can explain everything. I can explain why that video is something I want to make in the future, and this video about a similar topic is something I wanted to make right now. Just please stick with me. My plan was always that this would be a two-part video series. In my head, part one would be the road trip video, and part two would be a discussion on McDonald's themed locations which no longer exist. Themed McDonald's, which have since been closed, de-themed, lost, or are just generally defunct. But as I did basic research for the project earlier this year, I discovered something which terrified me. Out of the total list of themed McDonald's which were once open in America, the percentage of those which are still open is staggeringly low and a huge chunk of those have been closed in the past two or three years. Themed McDonald's have become an endangered species, but in a way that almost no one has taken note of. Furthermore, I discovered while working on this project that information about themed McDonald's is amazingly scarce. So not only is it hard to find locations which are still active, but even proving that closed locations once existed is a lot harder than you would think. Let me give you an example. Remember that log cabin McDonald's that I remember visiting in North Carolina? I have not been able to prove that that McDonald's ever existed. Or even that there was any log cabin McDonald's even close to the East Coast. There was a log cabin McDonald's in Canada, and there's two log cabins in Wisconsin, but I've never been to Wisconsin, and I've certainly never crossed the border. And this is a memory apparently that my grandpa doesn't remember and my sister doesn't really remember. So as far as you guys are concerned, and as far as my family is concerned, and as far as the world is concerned, one of the most memorable things that has stuck with me from my childhood is a memory that my brain made up as a joke. So to make it clear, this is not a video about themed McDonald's which exist in America. This is a video about defunct themed McDonald's and why they've become endangered. Now I will be occasionally mentioning themed McDonald's which actually still exist and you can go visit if you'd like. So if I talk about a McDonald's that is luckily still around, this little logo will pop up on your screen. But we're not exactly going to be seeing that logo very often, so if that little green M isn't there, that means the location we're discussing is now closed. At this point, I'd also like to stop and point out that I am not sponsored by McDonald's. I was bribed by McDonald's. There is a salient difference. So instead of a sponsor for this video, I would like to pass on two main calls to action. Hit subscribe, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I am trying to get to 500,000 subscribers this year, and I'm also trying to build up hype for a couple really cool projects that I have planned for May. So if you hit subscribe, you'll be notified about all that, and uh, yeah, you'll just make me really happy for a couple minutes. <laughs> And as for the Patreon side of things, I now have three, count them, three Patreon stretch goals that I think you guys would be really interested in. For 900 Patreon supporters, I will begin production on the Bigfoot trilogy of videos that I have been trying to find time to do for the last year or so. For 1,025 patrons, I will make a deep dive rabbit hole video about Homestuck, a sort of quasi-fallen titans. Now I know nothing about Homestuck, and I imagine it's a really weird series to get into, and I think you guys would enjoy that if it ended up happening, so uh, consider supporting me if you want that. And finally, for 1,500 patrons, I will make a sequel to this video where I travel around America visiting themed McDonald's which are still in existence. 
If you're interested in seeing any of those things happen and you want to see previews about the iCarly project and all the other things I'm working on and any scripts I have written, then consider supporting me there. Just pledging a dollar or two really means so much to me in the end. Finally, I want to send a big thanks to the Twitter account non-standard McDonald's. They have been posting about this for what feels like a year now, and they are obviously one of the main things that inspired me to finally work on this. And I've actually been talking to the person who runs the account, and they directed me on certain avenues to take when exploring this specific topic. Right now, if you go to my second channel, Quentin re you will find an interview, which I just did, with the person who runs that account. And I think that's really fun, so I would encourage you guys to go over and check it out. With that, let's jump back to the beginning. So, at this point in the video, I've attempted to construct a linear timeline of the history of themed McDonald's, when they started to appear, and why they started to appear. I don't consider 1950s McDonald's to be a coherent theme by itself. Saying that this is a themed McDonald's is like saying that this is a themed McDonald's, and, and like it's not, you just use kind of like a weird old blueprint. I also don't personally consider big to be a theme. Like, Old West is a theme, Outer Space is a theme, putting a McDonald's in a slightly larger building isn't very thematic to me. This is important because many people would argue that the first truly non-standard McDonald's was Make Overpass in Oklahoma. This location was built into the Will Rogers Turnpike and would go out of its way to advertise itself as the world's biggest McDonald's. Today, it is an empty shadow of its former self. But as I said, I don't think that big is a theme. I don't think there's anything really thematic about the Turnpike. I think they just built a McDonald's into a really big, really popular place. And that makes the actual, first, original themed McDonald's to be Barstow Station in Barstow, California. In the late 1960s, a man by the name of Fred Rosenberg happened to become the owner of a McDonald's franchise in California. The only problem? It was sitting in the middle of the desert, and did not gain much traffic. And so, in 1975, he came up with a brilliant idea. To convert this nearly forgotten McDonald's into a themed experience. And so, Rosenberg built a fake train station around this franchise, constructed several other buildings available to be rented out by other businesses and novelty shops, and advertised the opening of this oddity to the press, declaring that it was an authentic 1900 depot and America's first rail shopping mall. Two silver passenger Pullman train cars were then added to the side of the McDonald's, with seating placed inside, so visitors could eat their McDonald's meal inside of a real train as they watched the other trains go by. This was apparently a very popular experiment, as in his second advertisement to the press, Rosenberg had to apologize for how unprepared they had been for the massive crowds that showed up to experience his train-themed mini-mall and his McDonald's experience. Over the next decade or two, this same story keeps repeating over and over again. Randomly, in nooks and crannies of America, a very strange McDonald's would open, and it would turn out to be the vision of a rather creative franchise owner taking advantage of how much freedom corporate had willed them, with the actual McDonald's company not seeming too invested in the story. In 1976, a stained glass McDonald's opened in Ann Arbor, Michigan featuring beautiful designs both inside and out. In 1980, a permanent floating McDonald's was opened in St. Louis. And of course, in 1985, Rock and Roll McDonald's opened in Chicago, Illinois. In the 1980s, a few McDonald's opened in high-end neighborhoods which were built to be overly fancy to appeal to draconian zoning laws. And in Ohio around this point, another McDonald's opened which was, again, briefly the biggest in the world. 
but in my opinion, the ultimate themed McDonald's opened to the world in October 1990. Now, a quick disclaimer. I am about to describe to you the greatest restaurant of all time. And remember, I am only doing that because it no longer exists. So please, prepare yourself for heartbreak. So because of rock and roll McDonald's in Chicago, the 1950s and rock and roll became the two most popular McDonald's themes for locations around the country, with one, the other, or both popping up in several locations. Take, for instance, Solid Gold McDonald's in Milwaukee. Recognizable from a distance due to its bright yellow exterior and cutouts of the Beatles sitting in front of the restaurant. Inside, you could find rock and roll statues and priceless memorabilia, which you could ogle while you ate your side of fries. This isn't the best restaurant in the world, by the way. I just thought it was a fun detour. Anyways, in early 1990, a franchise owner named John Ritchie managed to obtain a key location for a Sacramento McDonald's, and he decided to act on this growing trend, but with a little bit of a twist. His idea was that his exclusive Sacramento location would be 1950s themed, rock and roll themed, and dinosaur themed. Soon enough, a mascot was envisioned and then built for this location. Named Elvisaurus Rex, the figure was intended to be a dinosaur version of Elvis. The character featured a purple jacket, a necklace with his first initial, and a pink guitar with a thruster on one end, implying a sci-fi angle. Directly above him was a ceiling mural depicting fish swimming around as if the location was meant to be underwater. To support this narrative, the location also featured a shark bursting out of the wall, biting a surfboard in two. Plans were also crafted for more outlandish decorations, such as a lifeguard and a surfer, but this apparently never came to fruition. All of these details seem to imply that this location is actually a 1950s rock and roll undersea sci-fi dinosaur McDonald's. Like I said, the greatest restaurant of all time. But if that's the case, then why is it gone? Why did they de-theme it? Well, stick around, because I promise you, we are going to be solving the mystery of who killed Dinosaurus Rex. Now, Dinosaur McDonald's quickly became the most popular McDonald's theme throughout the rest of the 1990s. First, in September 1994, the first Dinosaur McDonald's opened in Tucson, Arizona, building off of the popularity of Jurassic Park. After this, two more dinosaur-themed McDonald's would open in Arizona alone. One in Benson, featuring a velociraptor on the outside, and one in Phoenix, featuring intricate interior statues and decorations. Several years later, a lone dinosaur McDonald's would open in the state of Washington. Now, all of those locations are actually rather lucky, because out of those four, only one doesn't have any dinosaur theming left over. All of the other three still have at least one piece of dinosaur decoration that you can go and see today, and we'll be discussing why that is later in the video. Incidentally, here's a fun bit of dinosaur history which happens to involve a specific themed McDonald's. In 1990, a group of archaeologists discovered the remains of a massive T-Rex in South Dakota. The skeleton, nicknamed Sue after its founder, was the most complete and best preserved T-Rex ever discovered. But before much could be done to excavate the specimen, it was discovered that they had not discovered the remains on public land, as that location was essentially owned by the U.S. government. The archaeologist camp was raided, the bones taken into the possession of the government, and seven years later they were sold at auction, with the remains still yet to be excavated from the rocks that they had been found in. McDonald's was one of the companies who contributed funds so Sue could go to a public Chicago museum, and McDonald's alone funded the process of removing the remaining sediment from the bones, which took several years. 
They then opened a location inside that museum, which they advertised as Chicago's only dinosaur-themed McDonald's. This included murals, an outside terrace, and a prehistoric cave owned by Ronald McDonald. For the opening weekend of this location, anyone who brought in proper evidence that their legal name was Sue was given a free McFlurry. Now, it was ultimately the late 90s which saw a huge uptake in the creation of themed McDonald's. However, not many seemed to last very long. Among these was Air Max, a tribute to aviation in Springdale, Arkansas. Alongside featuring a museum of aviation inside the interior, a plane was placed on top of the restaurant with Ronald on board, waving down to the patrons below. This opened around 1997 and became suddenly unpopular a few years later. In 1998, in Allentown, Pennsylvania, race car McDonald's would open a project led by franchise owner Mike Fountaine, who would later become known as the number one McDonald's collector in the world. This location was decorated with tiled floors, posters of drivers, gas pumps, murals, and 3D wall art of racing cars. Luckily for us, a long article from that same year carefully documented Fountaine's motivations in doing this. The franchisee, who has taken his cue from Walt Disney, said, quote, We all sell burgers, fries, sodas, and shakes. But what makes this exciting is the entertainment. When all amusement parks have roller coasters, you have to do something more. At the end of the article, Fountaine quickly notes the freedom which McDonald's had delivered to franchise owners like him. Beyond meeting basic requirements for equipment, facilities, for handicapped guests and safety considerations from shatterproof glass to non-slip floor tiles, we have a tremendous freedom in decorating our restaurants. It just has to be in good taste. Now up to this point, we have covered a McFlurry of unique locations, to be sure. But it's after the year 2000 that things got absolutely bonkers, and suddenly, without warning, dozens of themed McDonald's began to open up all over the country. In 2002, a theater McDonald's opens in Columbus, Ohio. Then a NASCAR McDonald's opens in North Dakota, followed by a jungle-themed McDonald's in Newark, Ohio, a railroad-themed McDonald's in Mississippi, a UFO-themed McDonald's in Roswell, a jazz bar McDonald's in Austin, a Cubs-themed McDonald's in Chicago, Big Mac Museum in Irwin, Pennsylvania, Lodge-themed McDonald's in Mishawaka, Indiana, a NASA-themed location in Houston, Texas, a Zoo McDonald's in Dallas, Texas, a Happy Meals McDonald's in Dallas, Texas, a Christmas-themed McDonald's in North Pole, Alaska, another NASCAR McDonald's in Pennsylvania, another Zoo McDonald's in Bronzeville, Texas, a Broadway McDonald's in Shavertown, Pennsylvania, Gondola McDonald's in North Conway, New Hampshire, Stagecoach McDonald's in Dodge City, Kansas, and a Hunting Lodge McDonald's in Meredith, New Hampshire, which featured beautiful interiors and apparently a moose head on the wall which would talk to you. Try our new specialty coffee. So the mystery is, why did themed McDonald's go from something that happened twice a decade to something that happened 10 times a year? Well, I believe this is all explained offhandedly in a newspaper article about the Ohio Jungle McDonald's. In that article, the franchise owner explains why he chose the jungle as his theme by stating, McDonald's wants restaurants themed, and that's kind of what we have here in Newark. Every restaurant I build from now on will be one of these. This quote seems to directly confirm that sometime after the year 2000, themed McDonald's went from something that franchise owners did independently for the charm of it, to something that corporate directly encouraged. Now what you have to understand is around this time, themed restaurants were a huge thing in America. Hard Rock Cafe was a big deal, Rainforest Cafe was huge, David Copperfield almost had a restaurant where the entire bit was that people were gonna do magic in front of you. Like, for a few years in the middle there, it felt like the quality of the food was the last thing anyone cared about when there was a new place in town to eat. So you know that huge list of locations I just went through? Did you notice that I didn't mention Florida? That's because there are so many goddamn locations in Florida. 
To truly understand the story of themed McDonald's in Florida, there are two more eccentric franchise owners that we have to get ourselves aficionated with. That being Gary Orother and Keith Melton. Based on what I've come to understand, these two men never met once in their entire lives, yet their stories feel so similar. Both men lived in Florida in the late 90s and early 2000s. Both became enthralled with creating McDonald's experiences with a unique theme or twist. And both created so many of those experiences that no one else can really compete. So let's go ahead and dive into both of these guys and the McDonald's that they created. Starting us off, Keith Melton is a CIA enthusiast and a collector of spy memorabilia who at one point owned 36 different McDonald's franchise locations before he fell out of favor with the company after they, ironically, accused him of wiretapping. And I know what you guys are thinking, Quentin, that's really weird. And like, it's Florida, guys. Things were never gonna get less weird from here. Melton created his first themed McDonald's in 1998, when he opened a motorcycle-themed McDonald's. This was soon a hit, and he followed it up with his take on rock and roll McDonald's. And then... Hollywood McDonald's. Inside Hollywood McDonald's was a collection of movie posters and recreations of costumes from classic films such as Darth Vader, Frankenstein, and the Creature from the Black Lagoon. This was the only McDonald's in the world where you could eat while sitting right next to a perfect recreation of the Yoda puppet. Okay, so I, uh, I wanted to share this with you guys. Uh, I found a 360 degree view of this McDonald's and I was checking it out, you know, and I'm like, you know, there's some cool stuff here. There's, you know, Darth Vader over there. There's a Stormtrooper over here and, you know, kind of Yoda in his own corner. But to be honest with you, I'm just not sure that this really adds much to the uh, McDonald's experience. IT'S THAT MOTHERFUCKING WATO! Following this, Melton began a long string of different McDonald's decorated with racing vehicles and various cycles. This included motorsports. One of the visually loudest and most non-McDonald's looking McDonald's that I have ever seen. He also created a series of sports themed McDonald's, which he called McSports Zone which sadly, there doesn't seem to be a lot of information about online. Melton was a collector by trade, and sometimes it feels like he would design these various McDonald's mostly as a kind of convenient storage space for his various knickknacks. This is most obvious when one studies his magnum opus, the Museum of Spy and Espionage, McDonald's. This was a miniature museum of spy technology based around a sit-down family restaurant, which even articles at the time seemed to be incredulous about. Patrons can share that expertise while munching on a Big Mac. They can sit next to the Enigma, which Germans used during the war for their most secret communications without knowing Allied forces eventually broke the code. And Maxwell Smart would be proud to eat near the shoes ordered by the U.S. Ambassador in Czechoslovakia in the 1960s. Who asked for this? Out of these two franchise owners, the more famous and beloved is certainly Gary Orther, whose work you might be familiar with. Gary Orther first entered the fast food game in 1981 when he purchased several McDonald's in Orlando and started taking care of them. This included a location on Sand Lake Road, which was completely typical in every single way. Towards the end of that decade, play places were introduced as a facet of the McDonald's brand, and Gary decided to add this feature to the Sand Lake Road location. He then kept adding to it year after year, until he eventually owned the largest McDonald's play place in the world. And so he bulldozed it all to the ground and started again. Yes, for a reason that no one really seemed to understand at the time, Gary Orther toppled his most successful restaurant to the ground and rebuilt it into a massive, disorienting maze of miniature-themed sections. 
Perhaps he was bored, perhaps he was mad, or perhaps he really wanted to steal that world record back from the Russians. All that anyone really knows for sure is that in August 1992, an impossibly large McDonald's would open to the public. The location has gone by far too many names to count. On opening day, it was known as Mickey D's, but the press took to calling it Biggie Fry McDonald's. It was billed as the biggest play place in the world, and eventually, the biggest McDonald's in the world. But today, it is primarily known as Epic McDonald's and Entertainment McDonald's. Now, I won't bore you by telling you about every little thing they've replaced in the last 30 years, because it's literally the entire building and everything inside it, but I will tell you my personal favorite story from the early days of Epic McDonald's. So, when the restaurant first opened, it had a Maui room that had a fish tank in it, and inside the fish tank were fish, and someone said, Hey, this sucks. So they replaced the fish with alligators. I am not making that story up. For a brief time in 1998, if you played your cards right, you could go inside of a McDonald's and have alligators in a fish tank watch you eat, which is the most Florida sentence ever constructed. Gary eventually had an idea for a second McDonald's, which he opened within walking distance of his first. Built as if it were a magnificent castle, the location was essentially supposed to be a slightly more grown-up version of Entertainment McDonald's, with a sophisticated interior and games that teens and adults could enjoy. A few short years into all of this, Orther began to experiment with the idea of introducing menus to these locations which would include food that no other McDonald's in the world would serve. Alongside adding things like pizza to Entertainment McDonald's, he also opened a Bistro McDonald's, where you could order food from a special McDonald's Bistro menu. Combining Orther's output with Melton's and also a couple other franchise owners from the era, it's my calculations that there were precisely 25 themed McDonald's in operations in or around 2007. Today, there are barely five, and a few of those are barely hanging on. To me, this is one of the most damning examples of just how extinct themed McDonald's have become overnight. So what the hell happened? Is McDonald's purposefully trying to kill off these locations? And if so, why? Here's what you need to understand about the relationship between McDonald's and franchise owners. It is true that themed locations started to arise because of a total amount of creative control. However, there were also many negative drawbacks to that being the case. When I was trying to research various defunct locations, one thing that I often ended up doing was finding a town that had a themed McDonald's, and then searching the word McDonald's in the local newspaper from that town. And what I found a couple times would be an initial newspaper article about a unique themed McDonald's opening, and then a second article from a couple years later about massive health code violations at that same location. And it became really common when looking up reviews for these locations to read something along the lines of, This location has a really cool theme. It is the most disgusting restaurant I have ever been inside. It seems that the franchise owners being given control over what the restaurant looked like also meant they were given control over how clean the restaurant was, or what local ordinances were being followed, or how nice of a place it was in general. And this eventually led to an issue with the McDonald's brand, where there wasn't a consistent confidence from location to location of the quality being the same. I think most people born in the Midwest can relate to the plight of there always being that one McDonald's near your home that y you know better than to go to. And so, in 2018, it was officially announced that McDonald's had begun an initiative of modernization. By 2020, they intended to replace as many locations as they could with sleek, modern, technologically advanced, and sanitary locations. 
all standard to a design pre-chosen by the company. But on the topic of that new design, I think there's one more thing that we need to talk about if we're to understand the big picture of what happened at McDonald's. And that is... The Death of Ronald McDonald. As I'm sure anyone who's clicked on this video remembers, Ronald McDonald was McDonald's mascot from the 1960s up until about 2009. For many years, Ronald was praised for being a fantastic mascot who taught important things to kids and even dabbled in charity. And when he suddenly vanished from advertising, there was a lot of speculation as per why this had happened. Common theories held that the growing fear of clowns and children, or the general dated nature of McDonald Land advertising, were the key factors in the retirement of Ronald and his friends. But the true reason that Ronald vanished was actually much more simple. Due to various factors, after the turn of the millennium, the McDonald's brand suddenly became rather infamous. Partially due to films like Super Size Me that sought to criticize the effect that the chain supposedly had on society or something. And one of the main criticisms that was made of Ronald McDonald specifically was that because he was the mascot of both the McDonald's restaurant and the Ronald McDonald charity, which are in actuality two different organizations, was that he existed to shield the company from criticism and blur the lines of what they actually accomplished. So basically, an ultimatum was delivered to McDonald's by critics. Ronald McDonald could either represent the charity or the fast food company, but not both. And so, logically, the company chose to have him represent the charity. They pretty much stopped using Ronald McDonald because they were afraid that their own tarnished brand was going to affect his public image. And pretty much from the moment that they did that, they started a gradual but extremely important change in presentation. To put it simply, McDonald's used to be a restaurant for kids that parents and adults also kind of liked. But now, it's a restaurant for adults which kids are also allowed to enjoy. And in my opinion, the leading evidence of this being the case lies in the architecture of standard McDonald's. Five years ago, this is what a McDonald's was to me. It was bright and vibrant. It looked like something that would be sitting in the middle of a Hot Wheels playset. I mean, it looked like the toys that they would sell in the Happy Meal packages. But the most important detail to me was that the roofs of every location that looked like this were subtly striped with gigantic french fries. Each of these buildings were literally designed to make a child think about french fries without knowing the reason why. Now compare this to the new McDonald's locations which began to be installed in 2018. To me, these buildings look like something that you would throw together in InDesign, just a series of basic shapes and colors overlapping in a satisfying yet simple way. The cool brown colors and cursive text on the side of the building going out of its way to remind adults, yes, we have coffee. So what this whole modernization project is really about is that McDonald's locations around the country are being rebranded to target cynical older people instead of overexcitable children. Play places are disappearing, Ronald's statues and murals are being thrown into junk heaps, and unique McDonald's meant to appeal partially to children are now an obsolete part of the brand. And that's why a McDonald's which once looked like this now looks like this. And the list of themed McDonald's killed by this modernization campaign is almost too long to count. The Club Safari McDonald's? Gone in 2017. The Lodge themed McDonald's in Indiana? Gone in 2018. Stagecoach McDonald's? Zoo McDonald's? Broadway McDonald's? All apparently fixed in or around 2018. And tragically, it seems that Elvisaurus Rex was one of the casualties of this event, as that location was refurbished in 2017 or 2018, and the dinosaur rock star has not been seen there since. But there is actually a small crumb of good news. 
You see, while I was writing this, right at the end, it was suddenly discovered that there actually is another Elvisaurus Rex in the United States. It's at a location in Wald Lake, Michigan, a town with 7,000 people. Now, you might guess that what actually happened is that the statue simply moved when they rebuilt the Sacramento location. However, social media posts from the time have confirmed that both statues were in existence at the same time, and if you study the paint job specifically on the belly, it becomes incredibly obvious that these are both completely different statues. And this discovery has just inspired me. Because no matter how much has gone wrong in the world, no matter how little hope it feels like there is somewhere in the middle of Michigan, there is a little dinosaur Elvis rocking his way through the decade. And he's out there waiting for all of us. And that little Michigan dino, that little prehistoric dino star is also gone. They removed him during the pandemic. I wish that I had some good news to end this video on. I mean, the pandemic's gonna be over soon, that's good. And we're all gonna be able to go out and visit some of these locations if we want. But additionally, the economy reopening probably means that McDonald's is about to quietly continue their ongoing quest of modernization. Just a few weeks ago, a certain Twitter user's post went viral after a piece of Ronald McDonald decoration went missing after supposedly being there for a very long time. And if this is any sign of what's to come, we're about to experience quite a few tragedies in the next year or so. It was all a dream! But there is a little bit of hope for some of you. Because miraculously, a handful of locations have survived being renovated. Essentially, if there is a unique McDonald's near you, and the unique elements are not inside or attached to the building, then you might be in the clear. For instance, a McDonald's in North Carolina famously has a spinning sign. And because that's not connected to the building, they were allowed to keep that. And as I said, two of the dinosaur McDonald's in Arizona are still there. Because the dinosaur statues are outside of the building, so they were just left alone. The third location in Arizona only had interior decorations, and thus that one's just a normal McDonald's now. This is also true of the dinosaur McDonald's in Washington, which had both interior and exterior decorations at one time, but now only has exterior decorations. Specifically, a massive metal T-Rex skeleton sitting in the parking lot. However, if you have a unique McDonald's near you that does not meet those stipulations, it's very possible that that location being upgraded is simply inevitable. And you know, I'm kind of scared of that. Because I think if I never saw a themed McDonald's again, it would be like if I never saw Christmas decorations again. Like if one year we all just decided that we were too old to put up lights for the holidays. Part of me just wanted to see if we could spread awareness about this issue, if we could start some sort of campaign or something, to see if we could stop some of these tragedies before they inevitably happen. And I really do, seriously, want to get out there and explore some of the few locations which are still in existence. Specifically, the two log cabin McDonald's in Wisconsin are something that I just have to see in person. Sometimes that's all I think about. Just hitting the road one day and going up there and taking it all in. And that's why I want to encourage you guys to support me on Patreon if you want to see something like that. As a reminder, if we hit 900 patrons, I'm going to do a trilogy of Bigfoot videos. If we hit 1,025 patrons, I'm going to do a deep dive on the Homestuck series. And if we hit 1,500 patrons, then I am officially going to make the McDonald's road trip video. And I'm going to be extremely happy and have a very, very good time. Additionally, if you have any information about a non-standard McDonald's, especially one that no longer exists, 
there are two emails that I want you to send that information to. The first is my contact email that you can see on the screen right now, and the second is the contact email of the non-standard McDonald's Twitter account. If you have any photographs or VHS recordings of a non-standard McDonald's that no longer exists, you might legitimately have the only piece of evidence that that McDonald's ever existed. So passing that information on can be extremely, extremely important. I know this video is different from what I usually do and kind of the vibe of the channel right now. We have a few more Fallen Titans videos coming up after this, and right after that is the iCarly project, and I want to make sure no one misses that, so please hit subscribe. Uh, you're gonna, if you hit subscribe, you're gonna help us reach 500,000 subscribers and beyond, and it really makes my day when I see that number go up. Um, with that, I thought it would be fun for the Patreon outro, the rest of the Patreon outro, if I showed you some of the weird, stupid stuff I have on this shelf real quick. Yeah, so I thought I'd just show some of this off on camera real quick. I think a lot of it's really fun. Uh, ignore that. We're not going to talk about that. Uh, so this is my Barry Benson McDonald's box. I have a few McDonald's boxes. I got this when I was doing the B-Movie project a few years ago. Um, then I've got an iCarly box over here. I bought that recently. And then these are a bunch of, like, McDonald's toys and collectibles. Um, fun, weird things. I think this one's really fitting. Just a, f a bunch of, like, weird stuff. Um... <laughs> Up here are a bunch of Transformer toys they released. I think these are some of the cooler toys. And this is also a Transformer, I believe, from Spain or something like that. And in my opinion, the best McDonald's toys have always been the Transformers. Now, over here is what I really want to focus on. Uh, well, oh, first of all, I have a little McDonald's Volkswagen down here with the bumblebees. But after that, the thing I really want to show off is my Garfield McDonald's collection. I also have some of those mugs, but I don't really use them. But here we have um, a McDonald's box. You can see that they used to be a lot more fancy with how they were f folded. Um, but I think this is really cool. I'm glad I have this. And then this is my McDonald's employee Garfield plush. Now, according to what I can tell from my research, these were sold in employee uh, employee magazines they would give out where you could order, like, clothes and stuff. Um, and y y there was a specific bunch of pages for, like, plushies of the McDonald's land characters, and Garfield was included in there. And um, I got this guy really cheap, and I think he's one of the more rare Garfield plushies, but I think he has this fantastic energy, and I was I was very happy to get him. I think I even like him more than the big Garfield, just because I never thought I'd be able to get my hand on one of these for so cheap, and he's got the old uniform. So I'm really happy that I got that, and of course all this other stuff. Except for that, we're not going to talk about that. And so yeah, I just wanted to show this off this time because I always work so hard on the shelves and you can never see it all. It's funny. The final thing I want to show you guys is I have this pen here that is from the Canadian uh, log cabin McDonald's. And of course I have this jacket, um, which is also from the catalog I talked about. Um, and I think these are both like really cool. Uh, this is far too small for me. You can't see it, but it's a medium. I cannot button it up. But I think this is a really cool look, and I'm really happy with how this has turned out on camera. Um, but thank you guys so much for watching. Um, with that, I've been Quentin Reviews. This has been my Quentin Quarantine, and that's all you need. It's like a almost a quintessentially American thing. You know, yeah, these, yeah. these people who are weird hobbyists and collectors who kind of build out their legacy through entrepreneurship and it results in a line of themed McDonald's filled with movie posters. It is an oddly American tale.